Well, hello again, everyone. Um, today or this evening, or I guess whatever time it is where you're at currently watching this, we're going to be discussing uh, mood disorders and schizophrenia in children and adolescents. So uh, we'll just start with major depressive disorder. In children uh, and adolescents, and especially children, symptoms of depression may have more physical or somatic complaints than adults and older individuals. So again, you know, they may complain of just not feeling good, feeling sick, feeling headaches, my belly hurts. Uh, as young children, the gender rates are equal between females and males until adolescence in which females begin to have a higher rate of incidence. So the DSM-5 criteria, um, must have at least five or more of the following descriptors present for most of the day, every day, for at least two week time period. Uh, and it must be a change from previous functioning. Uh, at least one of the symptoms must be depressed mood or loss of interest in activities. So depressed mood, children ask the less, since this could be irritable mood, just irritated all the time. Uh, markedly diminished interest or pleasure in activities that were previously enjoyed. A significant change in appetite, either increased or decreased, insomnia, hypersomnia, almost every day, one of those two. Change in movement, maybe they're moving around all the time all over the place really fast, or maybe they're just really slowing down. Fatigue, loss of energy almost every day, feelings of worthlessness, excessive guilt, um, diminished ability to think or concentrate, difficulty making decisions, and reoccurring thoughts of death, dying, increased suicidal ideation. These are going to cause significant distress to them in their daily life and then of course cannot be attributed to substance, medical health disorder, or other mental illness. Um, and the important thing, remember when we're talking about depression, uh, to uh, differentiate between other mood disorders, they could never have had a manic or hypomanic episode because then we will get into a different diagnosis. Uh, most cases of depression can resolve within one year, you know, without any treatment. Uh, risk factors for children include though adverse childhood events, um, so those ACE scores can kind of increase the likelihood for kids to have depressive disorders, and genetics. So individuals with first degree family relative have two to four increased likelihood of developing the disorder. The differential diagnoses, um, manic episodes with irritable mixed moods, ADHD, adjustment disorder, depressed mood, or just sadness. Uh, comorbidities, of course, anxiety, eating disorders, borderline personality, OCD, and substance-related use disorders. So that's the gist of major depressive disorder. That's the DSM-5 of it. Um, again, you know, the big takeaways I would say is the two-week period, a change from previous functioning, and then they need to kind of meet um, those criteria. The, I don't think I put in this lecture, but there there are some mood disorder questionnaires. The PHQ-9 is a perfect example. I believe it starts at 11 age and up. Um, there's some other ones. Honestly, I just don't use them very much. PHQ-9 is the one that gets used a lot. Again, it can be helpful. It's pretty quick. It's not diagnostic, but it can just kind of give you an idea of how big of a struggle it is. The other nice thing I would just say this about screenings, anxiety or depressive screenings, is it gives you an objective scoring, right? Oh, I mean, because then you may talk to somebody and be like, I don't think things are any better at all. And so it allows us to say like, I mean, I could see that, right? I mean, I'm not, but I know when you first saw me, you filled out this, you scored a 19. You know, we've been, you know, you've been taking medicine or you've been doing therapy. We're seeing each other today. And I mean, you scored a, a nine. So, oh. I guess some things are better. So it can just give you the ability to show, um, or the other way, right? I'm trying, man, things are not getting better. They're still really, really struggling here. Uh, dysthymia. So dysthymia is a more persistent and it's less intense form of depressive disorders. It does not mean that these individuals are not struggling, just not quite as intense. The main takeaway for children and adolescents is that the depressed or irritable mood must be present most of the day, every day, persistently for a period of one year. Uh, adults, it's two years. So for kids, it's just one year. They cannot have more than two consecutive months without symptoms. They must experience two of the following six. Change in appetite, insomnia, hypersomnia, low energy, fatigue, low self-esteem, poor concentration, uh, feelings of hopelessness. Cannot be better explained by any of the other uh, criteria we talk about. 
major risk factor for children is loss or separation of parent, um, then they, you know, have a really good chance of starting to struggle with dysthymia. Uh, differential diagnoses of this um, major depressive disorder, psychotic disorder, <coughs> bipolar personality disorders, comorbidities would include substance use, anxiety, and major depressive. Uh, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, PMDD, is a period of time in which an individual will have defining characteristics of a mood or anxiety disorder. It resolves around a woman's menstrual cycle. Symptoms will often start to appear in the first week before menses begin, begin to improve a few days after onset of menses, and will be absent or minimal in the weeks post menses. In some individuals, the premenstrual phase has been considered a risk for suicide. So. When these symptoms all of a sudden start to flare up, sometimes they may be at more of increased risk for suicide. The DSM-5 criteria were more of the following symptoms must be present, marked affective lability, including mood swings, sadness, tearfulness, increased sensitivity to rejection, marked irritability or increased interpersonal conflict, marked depressed mood, feelings of hopelessness, self-depreciating thoughts, anxiety, tension, feeling keyed up. They almost have one of the following Symptom present, decreased interest in activities, difficulty concentrating, fatigued, marked change in appetite, hypersomnia, insomnia, sense of being overwhelmed, out of control, uh, can have physical symptoms, breast tenderness, swelling, joint muscle pain, bloating, sense of weight gain. Total number of symptoms must be five or more with at least one from each category. It must cause distress and cannot be explained in any other way. Uh, genetic predisposition plays a factor. Women who use oral contraceptives may have fewer premenstrual complaints, so their risk may go down. Differential diagnosis is premenstrual syndrome, dysmenorrhea, bipolar disorder. MDD is the most frequent uh, comorbid disorder, the depressive disorder. Uh, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. This gets, I think, because it's a little bit newer, uh, came out with the DSM-5 probably gets kind of thrown around a lot more. Uh, so DMDD, chronic severe persistent irritability, must be present in children before the age of 10, but it cannot be applied to children with a developmental age under six. So, you know, you have a four-year-old, we're not gonna be able to say they have DMDD. Um, so two major diagnostic criteria. One is frequent temper outbursts, can be verbal, behavioral, they're often severe, they can occur frequently. They're usually three or more times a week. They've been present for a year or more. They're occurring in more than one setting. So again, uh, they're not just like this at home, but then wonderful at school or vice versa. You know, they can't be, hey, at home, I mean, you know, we have some temper tantrums occasionally, but then at school they're throwing things, running out, you know, yelling. Then we would say, well, then this would not meet the criteria for DMDD, something else must be going on here. Uh, the tantrums are developmentally inappropriate. They must have an angry or irritable mood present most of the day, nearly every day in between the outbursts, and it's noticeable by others. So again, it's not just the outbursts. These kids are just irritable or angry. They just feel keyed up and just not fun to be around all the time. Um, so the DSM-5 criteria, severe recurrent outbursts, either verbally or behaviorally, uh, inconsistent with developmental age, occurring more than three times a week, mood is irritable or angry in between, noticed by others. Um, previous criteria has been present at least 12 months with no more than a three month consecutive time frame without symptoms. Criteria present in at least two settings, severe in at least one. Diagnosis should not be made before the age of six or after the age of 18. Symptoms should be noticed or recognized before the age of 10. So. Again, a kid who, man, honestly, they were pleasant. They never had any issues. They never had any struggles at all. Or, you know, maybe they had little struggles, but they weren't this chronic, irritable, angry kid who was having severe outbursts and two settings until they went to middle school would not be DMDD. Uh, there's never been a period of time more than one day in which criteria for a manic or hypomanic episode has been met because then we're gonna fall into a different diagnosis not better explained by any other illness, cannot coexist with ODD and intermittent explosive disorder. So this is one of those things where if you're like, oh, I think this child has intermittent explosive disorder and DMDD, DMDD is the only diagnosis. You know, oh, I think this child is oppositional defiant disorder and DMDD. Again, 
ODD diagnosis goes away, it's just DMDD. Um, bipolar disorder or conduct disorder and cannot be explained by effect of substance or medical neurological condition. Currents higher in males and females. Some studies show the stability of diagnosis is low. Only 20% of participants meeting the criteria for DMDD at two years follow-up, so things change. If an individual meets criteria for OCD and intermittent explosive disorder as well as DMDD, then the only diagnosis that should be assigned is the DMDD. Risk factors, children with chronic irritability, temperament, many children with DMD also meet criteria for ADHD and anxiety disorders. Differential diagnoses to consider, bipolar, oppositional defiance, ADHD, autism, uh, depressive disorders, anxiety, intermittent explosive disorder. Comorbidity, rarely do individuals meet only the criteria for DMDD. The comorbidity highest with DMDD than with other pediatric illnesses often meet criteria for ADHD, possibly autism, anxiety, and other mood disorders. So often, basically, you're not going to see a child think they have DMDD and that's the only thing, you know, and be like, and we're also having these other struggles. No set treatment for DMD results kind of, I mean, vary with SSRIs, SNRIs, antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, alpha-2 agonists. So, you know, we're really going to have to balance, are we getting help? Is this helpful? And then what's the side effect of this med? You know, if we're not getting any help, then I'm like, then the med's not working. We need to change or we need to do something different. If it's not giving us any benefit, then there's no reason to take it. Um need to watch reduction of symptoms mixed with possible side effects. So um, so the treatment for these mood disorders that we just talked about, fluoxetine and escitalopram are the only FDA approved medications for depression alone. Fluoxetine FDA approval starting at age eight, escitalopram at age 12. SSRIs are the first line of pharmacological treatment in depressive disorders. Medication and therapy, of course, create the best outcomes. There are handouts that you have listing the age ranges for all these different SSRIs. Again, think about the things we discussed about. And anxiety applies the same here with the SSRIs, SNRIs. Um, so bipolar disorder, another mood disorder. Uh, oh, real quick too, I know I said OCD and intermittent explosive disorder. That's not part of this lecture. so. You know, you need to compare and contrast the uh, DMDD with the differences between the intermittent explosive, the um, oppositional defiant disorder to really kind of understand what the differences of those are. Uh, bipolar disorder, unique um, that it requires an individual to have symptoms of either a manic or hypomanic episode. There's two different main diagnoses. We have bipolar one disorder and bipolar two disorder. In bipolar one disorder, an individual must meet the criteria for a manic episode. They can have moments of meeting criteria for depression, but it's not a criteria for diagnosis. So if anyone has ever had a manic episode in their life, they have bipolar one disorder. Bipolar two disorder would have symptoms meeting criteria for a hypomanic episode and often in between those hypomanic episodes, they are meeting criteria for depressive disorder. So you do have to have depression and the hypomanic episode to meet bipolar two uh, criteria. The criteria for manic disorder uh, episode, a distinct measurable period of time marked by increased irritability, expansive, elevated, abnormal increased goal, directed energy and focus lasting at least a week of time. With mood being present, uh, most of the day, almost every day, and any amount of time if hospitalization is required. This is for a manic episode. This is mania. So uh, lasts at least a week. Um, if you were ever hospitalized because you were still out of control, even if it was only three or four days, then it's a manic episode. During the time of increased mood disturbance or activity, three or more of the following are present. Four or more if only symptoms irritable mood. So if it's just irritable, then they need to have four of these. If it's elevated expanse, increased energy, focus, then it can be three of these. Um, and it's a noticeable change from the normal behavior. Inflated self-esteem or grandiosity, decreased need of sleep, um, increased rate of speech, racing thoughts, easily distracted, increased direct, goal-directed activity, excessive lack of impulse control. Uh, so with high consequences of so spending, gambling, substance use, sexual activity, risky business ventures. 
um, the mood disturbance is sufficient enough to show marked impairment in school or occupational settings often requires hospitalization or fit harm to the individual or to others. So individuals with a manic episode, they do not, are not able to really function. So they're kind of so out of control, so out there that they can't kind of function normally in society. So um, any lifetime occurrence of the manic episode is sufficient for bipolar one disorder. So that's bipolar one, that's a, or that's a manic disorder. So now the hypomanic episode, presentation is similar to mania, except the length of time, right? It's four to six days, so it's less than a week. Patient does not require hospitalization. They are not severe enough. They are not having marked impairment uh, settings. So it's still all those same criteria we talked about for mania, just kind of turned down a little bit. Um, so bipolar one requires criteria to be met for manic episode. Often individuals when experiencing manic or hypomanic episode, um, their first one is 18 years old. Family history of bipolar disorder is the strongest and most consistent risk factor for developing the disorder, tenfold increase. That's why we screen for this in family history so much. Increased risk of suicide, 15 time increase of the general population. Bipolar disorder may account for one fourth of all completed suicides. Females have the higher rate of suicide attempts. Males have higher rates of suicide completions. Differential diagnoses include other bipolar disorders, depressive disorders, anxiety, substance induced, ADHD, personality disorders. Um, Something that I would just put in, you know, it's a marked difference, right? So when I'm talking to individuals about have you ever, and I'm explaining a hypomanic type episode, I make sure to tell them this is different than how you're always functioning because sometimes you'll talk to individuals that have ADHD and they'll say, my thoughts are always racing or I always feel impulsive or, you know, I'm always starting things and never getting anything done or sleep's always a hard for me every night then of course this isn't manic or hypomanic. These episodes are defined where you can feel the beginning of it and then the end of it. Um, bipolar two disorder requires the individual as currently in the past met criteria for the hypomanic episode and major depressive disorder. Oftentimes individuals present to clinicians during periods of struggles with depressive episodes. Therefore, it's essential that they be screened for past experiences of hypomanic manic episodes. Often individuals feel that their periods of hypomania are reprieved from their depressive mood. So if they're feeling depressed all the time and they start to feel hypomanic, it feels good, even though it can get out of control. Average age of onset is mid 20. So it's a little bit later for bipolar two than bipolar one is 18. A bipolar two is mid 20s, although it can appear in adolescence and young adulthood. Genetic predisposition is greatest risk factor. Individuals with bipolar 2 have increased risk for suicide, difficulty in maintaining employment, increased risk of substance use disorder. Differential diagnoses would be other bipolar disorders, ADHD, mood disorders, personality disorders. Cyclothymia, chronic fluctuation of mood that does not fully meet the criteria for either manic or hypomanic episode or a major depressive disorder. So uh, they're going to be like, Oh, I've had a day maybe where I felt that way. Okay, have you had two, three, four, four, six days in a row? No. Okay. I mean, I feel sad sometimes for a week. Okay, have you felt, you know, met these uh, two weeks or more and kind of going over those depressive symptoms? No. So then we're kind of following into cyclothymia. Uh, the DSM-5 criteria, period of at least a year in children and adolescents in which there have been numerous periods with hypomanic and depressive symptoms that do not meet the criteria for either. The episodes have been present for at least half the time and the individual has not been without symptoms for more than two months. Criteria for depressive or hypomanic episodes have never been met. Symptoms cannot be better explained by other mental health. So, <coughs> bless me. Cyclothymia often develops in adolescence, young adulthood, 15 to 50% chance it will develop into a bipolar disorder. Among children, cyclothymia, the mean age of onset is six and a half. Major risk factors is first degree relative with bipolar disorder. Differential diagnosis would include other bipolar disorders, mood disorders, anxiety disorders. 
Children with cyclothymia disorder are more likely than pediatric patients with other mental disorders to have comorbid ADHD. So again, you know, when we're thinking of all, you know, bipolar, uh, disruptive mood dysregulation, cyclothymia, you can kind of see how a lot of these symptoms, and especially when we're talking with kids, it's really hard. We can say the criteria and, uh, you know, we may not get a full picture of if they are meeting this exactly. So it can be really tricky sometimes to really differentiate between them. Um, you know, some of them have really major, you know, uh, diagnostic criteria, the major, um, for like DMDD, right? Three or more major temper tantrums. But the hard thing too is what feels major to one parent may not feel as major to another parent. Or, you know, school even can be hard. What's a tantrum in school? You know, again, what else is going on? Or is there an expectation that these kids should not be kids? And so it can make kind of really weeding out and differentiating between these diagnoses, I think, really difficult. Um, so when we're thinking of treating the mood disorders, CANMAT, uh, Canadian study, acute management of mania in children and adolescents, uh, the whole, I think I provided the whole article for you. It's really great on bipolar disorder. It goes through adults and it also has a section on children, but the acute management of mania, uh, first line, lithium, risperidone, aripiprazole, acinepine, quetiapine, second line, olanzapine, suprazidone, third line, divalprolax. Uh, then there's the, can the acute management of bipolar depression. I'm actually not going to sit here and read all these. It's written here for you guys that you can look at. Uh, the maintenance treatment, first line. Um, so antidepressants should use very cautiously in children with bipolar disorder due to the possibility of antidepressant-induced mania. So it's why it's so important to screen relative. It's why it's so important to, when we see patients that come in for depression, we need to screen for hypomania episodes. And I say mostly hypomania because manic episode would probably be known, but we need to screen for these because if they have met these criteria and we're really worried or thinking about a bipolar diagnosis, then we really, really need to be careful with our antidepressant usage. Um, so monitor lithium levels with its use. Remember small therapeutic window for lithium excreted by the kidneys. We want to avoid NSAIDs want to watch fluid balance. So anytime if they have gastroenteritis or heavy perspiration, we need to really worry that they could get toxic with lithium. Lamictal, risk of Stephen Johnson syndrome, important to really titrate that up slowly. Antipsychotic, antipsychotics and the extrapyramidal syndrome symptoms. So we have to watch metabolic thyroid function, gynecomastia with risperidol. Um, so th I think that's what makes all these meds really difficult is they come with really big side effect issues. It's not just, you know, no risk with these meds. These meds come with risk. So we want to make sure that if we are prescribing them to kids that we are really specifically trying to help a major problem and that we are monitoring and if it's not getting helped that we need to stop the med. Um, so, table three, use mood stabilizers. Uh, okay, most used mood stabilizers and atypical psychotics to treat uh, BD in children and adolescents. Medication dose side effects. Oh, this is going through these different meds. So, um, this is kind of talking about the mood stabilizers. Lithium, the Divalprox, the carbamazepine, the oxcarbazepine, the lamotrigine, the topramate. Uh, and then talks about the different um, antipsychotics, risperidol, lanzapine, quetiapine, aripiprazole, suprasidone. Um, so it has some doses. Remember, we just need to be careful when we're writing these meds. Doesn't mean we don't ever use them, but I always really try and think through if I'm prescribing a med, why am I prescribing this? What am I trying to help? Um, and make sure that it's really necessary and needed. Um, so again, you're going to see mostly major depressive disorder. You may see some, maybe some dysthymia in those kids. It's a little bit trickier. Um, 
probably some premenstrual dysphoric disorder in our um, female patients, adolescents, age, um, or individuals who have started having menses. Uh, and then the disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Remember the difference, these kids. We don't wanna just throw this around flippantly. We wanna make sure we're really, they're really trying to meet the criteria. And if they're not, what else may be going on? Uh, and then the bipolar disorders. So uh, moving on to schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. So I'll just be honest, this is not a, I work outpatient only. So an individual maybe who does a lot of training or has worked a lot inpatient, you probably would be much more well versed in schizophrenia than I am. I don't hardly ever treat it. I don't know if I've ever treated it with in a child, some adults, um, but it can exist in children. And so we need to kind of be aware uh, and have an idea of what we would do if we started to um, see somebody who's struggling. <clears throat> schizophrenia that occurs in children and adolescents, it's termed early onset schizophrenia. Before age 13, it's referred to as very early onset. So it's often slow, progresses gradually, may start with relational or academic or behavioral issues in the child. They may have issues with substance abuse. Males outnumber females in incident rate at younger ages, but kind of these rates equal into late adolescence and adulthood. In order for diagnosis to be considered, one must have a minimum of one month or of two or more psychotic symptoms, which have included hallucinations, delusions, disorganized speech, disorganized behavior, and negative symptoms. To make the full diagnosis, symptoms must have been present for over six months. So this is for schizophrenia. Schizophreniform is an illness that meets the criteria for schizophrenia, but symptoms have been present longer than a month, but less than six months. Kind of a placeholder. Maybe things get better. Maybe this continues to progress into schizophrenia. This diagnosis can be used until further time and evaluation allows for more symptoms and outcomes to become known. Brief psychotic disorder is at least one symptom of delusion, hallucination, or disorganized speech and have been ill less than a month. Schizoaffective disorder, an individual meets criteria for schizophrenia and also meets criteria of a mood disorder, either depression or bipolar. The four psychotic symptoms, hallucinations, false sensory, false sensory perceptions included auditory, tactile, olfactory, visual. In adults, most common is auditory. In children, it is often visual. Need to differentiate, though, the difference between a hallucination and illusion. So if I'm talking to an individual about this, I may say, you know, it's really not uncommon to wake up in the middle of the night and think you see something in the room and you kind of rub your eyes and realize, oh, it's just the towel hanging on the door. You know, that's not a hallucination, that's an illusion. You kind of recognize that that isn't what you thought it was and that it's actually something different. Uh, disillusions, a fixed false belief not better explained by someone's education or cultural beliefs cannot be persuaded as false even when evidence is presented. In children, delusions are often persecutory in nature. They may believe they are being followed, watch, fear of abduction or kidnapping, must differentiation between true delusions and learned behavior from parents or peers. So. You know, if you have uh, parents or peers that are kind of always talking maybe about the government out to get you or, you know, um, maybe some sort of other belief system that's taught, then that's not necessarily delusion. That's a kind of taught behavior. Uh, also, younger children remember fantasy play is not the same as delusional belief. So a kid that has a imaginary friend, you know, as long as it's, developmentally appropriate, that's not a delusional. Now, if you have a 17-year-old talking about their imaginary friend who is always having conversations with them, then we begin to think something different is going on. Uh, disorganized speech, so loose association and sentence structure makes communication difficult. Uh, logical thinking kind of all across in their speech, kind of often word salad, right? Stuff's just getting thrown in like, what are you talking about? Uh, in children, you have to differentiate with developmental age and other possible diagnoses such as autism disorder, right? Sometimes those individuals may kind of really throw things together. So this may not be schizophrenia. Uh, it may be autism. Uh, disorganized behavior, movement, or behaviors have no goal directed or grossly inappropriate. So must differentiate these from behavior in intellectually disabled individuals will be most evident as a regression from former functioning. So 
had a period of time where we did not move like this or have behavior like this and now a new change. Um, so those are all the positive symptoms, right? So we can think of, you know, an individual, these kind of are in addition to what normal life would be, right? Someone normally acting, again, we're adding something to it. Negative symptoms, kind of taking things away, right? Lack of interest in the world, social withdrawal, inability to feel or express, express pleasure, uh, that's anhedonia. Decreased sense of purpose, lack of motivation, abolition, difficulty speaking, elogia, a flat affect, lack of eye contact, physical inactivity. Those are the negative symptoms being taken away. Uh, there is just a small table of some FDA approved pediatric atypical antipsychotics. So um, ones that are approved in pediatric use need to monitor the same labs kind of as we discussed when uh, with the bipolar disorder. So we need to think about all these same things when we look at these atypical antipsychotics. Um, you know, I think that for me, doing PEDS for a long time, when you do normal PEDS, primary PEDS, you know, we really don't prescribe medicine if we don't need to, right? My kid has a cold. Great. I'm not going to give you amoxicillin. Uh, my kid's ear hurts. Okay, I'm telling you it's not an ear infection right now, so I'm not giving you any box. Their throat hurts. We're not getting any box. This is virus in nature. Uh, so again, I think I kind of carried this into psychiatry. If I don't have a really good reason to write Abilify, I'm not going to write Abilify. You know, I'm going to try a lot of other meds before I start using these atypical antipsychotics. I think in kids in general too, I think we always need to think, how do we help right now? And then what's our long-term plan as well, right? So I'm seeing someone that's 12. Well, if we take these antipsychotics for the next 30 years, we are very highly likely gonna develop EPS system, uh, symptoms. And now we're only gonna be in our 30s or 40s and we may have you know, things that we can't just reverse. So really be careful when we're writing these meds for kids. Really feel, are we getting benefit from this? Um, and don't just feel like we're just trying to put some control on a symptom. We want symptoms to improve, we're not trying to control kids. Uh, and so we just need to be really careful and make sure that we're continuing to monitor these individuals. If we are writing these meds, we need to continually be checking on them um, and think through just the other risk factors, right? Um, these atypical antipsychotics, you know, they carry those metabolic syndrome risk, the thyroid risks, the, um, you know, look, make sure you know all those risk factors um, when you're writing these meds and who they'd be appropriate for and not appropriate for. So hopefully you found this lecture beneficial, educational. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'll do my best to, to answer them for you. Uh, good luck studying and hopefully you'll be able to use this in your practice. Thanks.